Well, today is um, uh, our last day in this sermon series on the parables of Jesus. I hope you've enjoyed going through the parables. I've heard from some of you, Pam especially, has shared that you know looking at these parables has been helpful. Sometimes parables can be confusing. Um, you know, more than one of you have said, you know, why doesn't Jesus just come out and say what he's going to say, right? Um, and it dawned on me today when uh, that was mentioned to me that one of the reasons, I, I haven't really mentioned this in my sermon series, one of the reasons Jesus uh, spoke in parables is because we will eventually be judged, right, on the amount of revelation that we've been given. And parables are really... Jesus' mercy on those people, and even people today, to say, I know some of you aren't going to get it. You're not going to see it. And so I don't want to I don't want to just lay it out with the truth and make it so obvious, because then you're going to get judged based on that. So I'm going to I'm going to put it in the form of a parable. Scripture tells us so that. Because I know you're, some of you aren't going to get this, but if your eyes are open, you're going to get it. And so it's really, why does Jesus use parables? Part of it is his mercy for those people who just would not get it, even if he laid it out plain as day with them. And then they would have to be uh, responsible for knowing it that clearly. So, um, you know, amazing the amount of uh, mercy and grace that Jesus shows, uh, even those who reject him. Well, today's parable, our last parable, is um, one about a wedding. Uh, I don't know if you have anybody got a wedding in their uh, summer, they're going to go to a wedding, maybe a kid or a grandkid, I see a couple of hands there, uh, people are throwing their phones on the floor, you know, it's all kinds of excitement today, yeah. <laughs> but um, weddings are a lot of fun to go to, especially if they're people you know and love and, and uh, can, can take in the joy of uh, of the wedding. Uh, as a kid, I never liked going to weddings, but uh, now as an adult, I enjoy going to, to them. I've done, you know, as a pastor, I've done uh, several weddings. Uh, there's a few that are, were kind of uh, kooky. One day I was mowing my lawn and I got a phone call from uh, somebody uh, who sometimes attended our church and they said, we're getting married. We had planned this, you know, months ago. And the guy who's supposed to officiate didn't show up. Can you get over here quick? You know, help us out. And normally I'm, you know, like real disciplined about, hey, I want to go through premarital counseling with this couple and everything. But I would, you know, I knew them and I was just like, oh, I, you know, I feel so bad for you. Sure, I'll come over. So I, that was sort of a last minute uh, memorable wedding. It was kind of fun. But today Jesus is going to talk about a wedding. I think Jesus liked weddings. You'll remember that his very first miracle took place at a wedding. He turned water into wine. And, uh, you know, when God created the world and created animals and people, uh, he, when he made humans in his image, he made them male and female, right? And one of the reasons for marriage is to reflect that two become one, you know, in, in God's case it's three and one, uh, to the world to reflect that mystery to the world. Kind of cool. So today our, uh, our parable uh, involves uh, a wedding of the son of a king. And I'm just going to read through it first and then uh, we'll, we'll put it up on the screen afterwards uh, as we go through it section by section. So we're looking at Matthew 22 verses uh, 1 through 14. Jesus spoke to them again in parables saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants and mistreated them and killed them. The 
king was enraged and he sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the streets and the corners and invite to the banquet everyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets, gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see his guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. And he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? And the man was speechless. Then the king told his attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. So, as you hear this, begin to think back over the weddings you've been to. This, bed, this wedding probably has some things that are similar to 21st century weddings, and then other things that are very different from uh, the weddings that we attend and are part of. So let's go through this um, section by section. Starting in verse 2, Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. This, this parable is one of the... Uh, closest, tightest analogies to the kingdom of heaven, to heaven, uh, that you'll ever find. Uh, it's very, uh, kind of, this story and the actual facts of heaven uh, kind of parallel each other pretty closely. Uh, to illustrate, he talks about a king. You know, who is it that we know is the king? God the Father, right? He's the king of all kings, Lord of all lords. And this king has a son. Ah, interesting. King of all kings, Lord of all lords has a son, right? Jesus. Uh, and this son has a bride. Who is the bride of Christ? Well, we're told in Scripture we are the bride of Christ, the church, the people uh, who make up the church. Uh, the New Testament talks about uh, the church being betrothed to Christ, and it's our responsibility during this betrothal period to keep the, the, um, the bride pure, just like a regular bride, uh, not to go off with other gods and defile themselves, and upon Christ's return to present that bride to him, clean and pure like a, like a virgin bride to Christ. So, the king of this story, in preparation for the wedding, he throws a party, and he has his servants go to those who have been invited. And the phrase is, to those who have been invited. And Jesus, as Jesus tells the story, he's, he's talking about the Jews. That, that special group of people, God's chosen people. Uh, God sends, uh, has sent his prophets. Most recently at this time of, of Christ, he had sent John the Baptist. But the, re, the Jews refused to come to the party. They were not responding to his invitation. They refuse to enter into the joy that a wedding can bring. So we pick it up in verse 4. Then he, the king, sent more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My ox, fat and cattle, have been butchered. Everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business, the rest seized his servants and mistreated them and even killed them. So we see as we read through the New Testament that Jesus and the apostles went first to the Jews, telling the Jews that everything is ready, the bridegroom is here, the table is set, don't delay. You know, you remember Jesus when confronted by the Pharisees and Jews, uh, you know, why, why don't your disciples fast like John the Baptist? And his response is, well, the bridegroom is here. You don't fast when the, the bridegroom is here. You know, someday I'll go away, and then they'll fast. So the Jews are not responding. Uh, as a matter of fact, they paid no attention and actually killed some, threatened to kill Jesus, eventually do kill Jesus. Uh, you know, and it won't be long, and the first martyrs will start to fall, Stephen being the first among them. 
So, verse 7 says, The king was enraged, and he sent his army to destroy those murderers and burn their city. Some feel that this is a uh, prophetic statement, too, uh, pointing to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Again, you can see how, how tightly this story, this analogy, this parable runs to actual facts, things that would have been happening. I would imagine the people who are hearing this story would begin to kind of, I think I know where you're going with this, right? This is not uh, some highly cloaked story. This is uh, easy to understand. Well, picking up in verse 8, he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I've invited did not deserve to come. So, go into the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you can find. So the servants went into, into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good. Interesting comment. The bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. So who are his servants? Well, these are the people, the believers, that we read about in Acts, who are followers of Christ. They're the Christians who kept the faith down through the ages. There are brothers and sisters in Christ who have obeyed the Great Commission, which, by the way, sounds an awful lot like what Jesus is saying here. Go to the street corners. Go into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. Invite everyone, the good and the bad. That's who they're gathering. Not necessarily just the chosen people, just those people who were invited initially, but the good and the bad. They're gathering Gentiles, like you and I, and praise the Lord that they are. Amen? Picking it up in verse 11. So when the king came in to see his guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. And he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, my friend? And the man was speechless. So at this time period, you know, when Jesus walked the earth, it was a custom for the father of the bride or whatever to provide his guests with special clothes for them to wear to the wedding and the wedding feast. And here's a guy who obviously is showing that he shouldn't be there. He got in somehow without his wedding clothes. Again, it's easy to tie uh, the clothes that we are given when we as Gentiles are invited to partake in the joy of the bride with the clothes that are expected to be on this, this attendee of the wedding. You know, you might be asking yourself, well, what, what clothes are you speaking of? You know, I, I didn't get any clothes when I started uh, attending church or became a believer. Well, you did, in fact, as a matter of fact. Um, not on, not a, on our own, but we take on the righteousness of Christ, the robes of righteousness. Remember the Beatitudes where it says, blessed are the poor in spirit. And that's not saying blessed are the poor spirited, but basically blessed are the poor in spirit. They're, they're spiritually poor. They, they don't bring anything to the table. I always say what we bring to the table in, in this relationship with Christ is we bring a big bag of sin. That's all we've got to offer. But it says, blessed are the poor in spirit, spirit for those for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And why is theirs the kingdom of heaven? Because for our big bag of sin, Christ gives us his righteousness. You know, the worst trade of all time, but the best trade from our side of the deal. Uh, he puts on our uh, uh, puts on robes of righteousness on us. We don't have any righteousness to bring. Uh, Isaiah 61, verse 10 says this, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. So there's more of that wedding bride, bridegroom imagery. We're given robes of righteousness. We're told in Romans
Romans 13, verse 14, and Galatians 3, verse 27, that we're to put on or to be clothed in Christ. It's only when we have Christ and His righteousness that we can enter into this wedding feast. So picking it up in verse 13, this parable it says, then, then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know, if you don't have these robes of righteousness that none of us can bring, all we bring is our big bag of sin, we only get those from Christ. If you don't have those, if you don't have your invitation, if you will, however you want to look at it, you, you can't get in. This is a clear reference to heaven and hell. Uh, I was talking the other day with some folks here and actually ended up talking with one of the people who I give rides to in the medical transport job that I have during the week. That, you know, I hear people say often, you know, I don't know, I can't believe in a God who would send someone to hell. You know, but you never hear somebody say, I can't believe there's a God who would send bad people to heaven. You know, I can't believe that God allows us, has figured out a way to impart his righteousness to us so that we sinners get to go to heaven. That's really the truth of the matter. Notice that there's nothing in this story, nothing in this parable uh, about doing good works. Uh, the guest without the wedding clothes it, it is not told to go off and do so many Hail Marys. You know, this, this guy who doesn't have his wedding clothes is not told to go do community service, get his act together, you know, join a group, figure out a way to kind of earn his way into this wedding. No, it's all about uh, the fact that the invitees uh, were never told that there's any expectations on them. As a matter of fact, we're told that some of them are bad. Remember, the bad and the good are invited. If the kingdom of heaven was only for good people, Jesus would have told a whole different story, right? But he didn't. And finally, he ends with those famous words, for many are called, but few are chosen. Or as we say in the North Country here, many are cold, but few are frozen. Right? <laughs> God's invitation goes out to many. God's invitation goes out to all. But not many. Actually, the, the word says few respond and show up for the wedding. This word chosen can sometimes uh, be translated as choice. Or uh, as in the best, you know, if you're talking about choice cuts of meat, uh, people like to endless, endlessly discuss this question, you know, were we chosen by God or did we respond and, and uh, choose to, to uh, respond to God's invitation? I think it's interesting that Jesus uses a wedding banquet uh, for a, a king. Here. I can imagine some people at this dinner sitting around talking to each other over the meal, and one of them says, oh, I can't believe the king chose me to come to the wedding bank. And his friend says, well, you know, think of it this way. I mean, you got an invitation, but it was your choice whether you came or responded or not. And they're both right, right? And that really is the, the answer to that question. Did God choose us or did we respond? Yes, both those things happen. And both of those things are illustrated right here. The real question is not, you know, were we chosen? Did we respond? Was it our decision? Was it God's decision? Is it predestined or is it something we have free will over? The real question is, have you responded? Are you uh, going to the wedding feast? Jesus is the one who said that there's two kinds of people. To kind of restate what he's talking about here, either you're going to the wedding or you're not. Uh, I talked earlier about the fact that we, the church, the people who are his followers, are called to be his bride. Uh, you know, I've said this before, but the, 
the Christian faith is all about having a relationship with Christ. Uh, it's not about having done enough good things to convince God that you should be allowed into heaven. You know, nobody in this parable had to do enough good things to be allowed into the, to the wedding feast. It's all about who you know, not about what you've done. And the question is, do you know Jesus? You know, to continue with the wedding analogy, it's just like when a, a man meets a woman, they fall in love, they decide to take the next step, and the man usually, not always, asks the woman, will you marry me? And now she can know all about him, she can love him, she can think he's great, maybe she knew him all her life, but until they go before a judge or a pastor, uh, and that person asks them, you know, do you take this woman, do you take this man, and they say, I do, until that point, they're not married. They might love each other, they might know all about each other, they might be, think that each other are great, but there's a point in time where they say, I do. And, and from that moment on, they're married. The same thing is true with Jesus. You can learn all about him. We're glad you're here learning all about him. Uh, you can love him. You can believe he's real. Maybe you've known him all your life. But he's saying, will you take the forgiveness that I offer and follow me? And my question for you is, have you said, I do. I will. I will follow you. Now, there's much more to following Christ, just like there's much more to being married. Uh, marriage and a relationship with Christ both start out very simply, right? Uh, by saying, I do. But they both take a lifetime of daily living and daily talking and trusting and dying to self for there to be a real marriage that is growing and healthy. And that's how I'd kind of like to end our time here together today is as the music team uh, comes up in a minute um, and leads us in a final closing song, I want you to think about this proposal that Jesus offers to all of us. Come follow me. And if, if you have not gotten to that point where you've said, I will, I do, I want to follow you. Uh, maybe today is the day to, to make that commitment. And uh, when our service is over, I'm going to kind of stay up front for a while. If, uh, if that's something you want to do, you, maybe you have a few questions before you, you say that. Uh, I'll be here to, to answer some questions or pray with you uh, if, that's, if that's helpful. So um, I just want to encourage us all to uh, take a moment. And if you've made that decision, if you've said, yes, I do, uh, use this time to to reaffirm that and um, enjoy, you know, take some joy in the fact that you are uh, responding to that invitation to the wedding feast. And what a great day that will be. The video that Deb had us look at there, uh, you know, I can't wait to go to heaven. Um, perfect. That's That will be the wedding day, right? And what a day that will be. So let's pray together. And again, I'll be up front here if you, if you want to pray or talk with me. Lord, thank you so much that you um, sent your son. Thank you that he taught us these great truths about what the kingdom of heaven is like. That it's like a wedding feast where the king sends his son uh, and, and sends out invitations. Lord, I pray that we would all be counted among that number of that many are called, but few are chosen. Lord, I pray that we would rejoice in the fact that, that we have your righteousness because uh, those are our robes. Those are, that's the proof that we um, belong to you. And Lord, I pray if there's anyone here who hasn't made that decision, who's considering saying, I do, say, yes, I want to follow you, that, Lord, your spirit would speak to their spirit and they would make that decision today. And, Father, we ask all of this in